Good afternoon, everyone. It gives me great pleasure to chair the paratriathlon session on behalf of Marisol Casado. Marisol is not well, so I hope she's going to be feeling better soon. I've been instructed to provide some context for the session, and I'll be brief because I know some of our presenters have to leave. One of my responsibilities as an IT executive board member is paratriathlon, and prior to this position, I also served on the paratriathlon committee. Um, so the paratriathlon has been, I've been part of this journey, and unlike our able-bodied counterparts, we're not just peaking for Rio and preparing for Tokyo, we're also debuting in Rio, and this, I, I can assure you, is no easy task. So as hard as our athletes, coaches, and NFs have been working behind, working, behind the scenes, the staff, especially Eric Angsted, the paratriathlon committee, and various working groups and classification teams, and the IT executive board have been working just as hard to ensure that we make Rio a great success so that we can pave the way for more sport classes in Tokyo. I've just returned from the IPC General Assembly uh, meeting along with Eric and Antonio uh, in Mexico City, where uh, we as ITU representatives were very well received. The IP IPC leadership are impressed with what we have managed to achieve in such a short space of time, and they're also confident in our ability to continue developing our sport. High on the IPC and our own agenda is refining our classification system, especially the VI classification system, and this will be the thrust of our research going forward. Other key areas of focus are athlete development and the involvement of women. So to today, in this paratriathlon session, we'll we be addressing some of these aspects. So here we are, and uh, Scott Murray tells me that um, at the last conference, there was only one poster addressing issues related to paratriathlon. Today, we have three uh, presentations, and hopefully next time in Edmonton, uh, we'll have more. So without further ado, I'm going to present, uh, I'm going to just give a brief overview of our presenters and I'm changing the program because we have some speedy uh, transitions to make. So Inigo Moyike is going to uh, be first up and he earned his PhD in biology uh, of muscular exercise at the University of St. Etienne in France. He received a research fellowship in Australia, France, and South Africa, and he's published 100, 100 articles in peer-reviewed journals, four books, and 30 book chapters, and has given uh, over 250 lectures and communications in international conferences and meetings. So he's now associate professor at the University of Basque Country, he's associate researcher at Finis Terre University in Chile, and an associate editor for the International Journal of Sports Physiology and Performance. So I hand you, him over to you now. It's me again. Uh, sorry about this change in the program, but I have to uh, go and catch a plane, so um, I had to go first. Um, first of all, I would like to emphasize that I do not pretend to be an expert in paratriathlon. I am not an expert in paratriathlon, but uh, I was fortunate to, um, to work with, uh, with a paratriathlete uh, for two years that became world champion in the long distance. And this is just a case study. I'm going to present about the work that we did with this, with this particular paratriathlete. As you all know, uh, paratriathlon uh, will be Olympic for the first time in, in Rio in 2016. And although the ITU has been uh, having paratriathlon world championships every year since 1995, we had to wait uh, almost 20 years or more than 20 years for the sport to become, to become Olympic. In fact, in December 2010 is when the uh, International Paralympic Committee accepted paratriathlon into the, into the games. And the sport will make its debut in, in Rio over the uh, sprint distance. And the inclusion of the sport in, in the program uh, 
set very clear performance goals for many paratriathletes that were already in the sport, but also attracted a lot of attention from athletes who were in other sports uh, to make a transition into paratriathlon. And although we have been uh, seeing paratriathlon in the World Championships since uh, 1995, as far as I know, there are no uh, research papers documenting the physiological and the physical characteristics of elite level paratriathletes or the training that these athletes follow in order to reach their levels of performance. So the aims of, uh, of this presentation are, first of all, because we had the unique opportunity to train this athlete, is he is uh, below the knee amputee, uh, involved in a talent transfer initiative for two competitive seasons, 2011 and 2012. We would like to uh, report on the evolution of his physical and physiological attributes over this period that we followed him up and that we coached him and also to describe the training program that he followed to become the 2012 ITU long distance world champion. The athlete, as you can see in this, uh, in this slide, was already uh, 37 at the time we started the, the follow up with him. Uh, when he was 20, he suffered the amputation of his uh, lower left leg below the knee in a motorcycle accident. So at the time, 2011, 2012, he was in the Tri-5 uh, category, which in the new system would be a PT4 sports class. During, the, uh, when, during, his, um, 20, during his 20s, he, um, he was an alpine skier, and he reached a, a pretty high level. He became national champion, and. He was qualified for the, for the uh, Paralympic Games, but unfortunately he broke his arm uh, a couple of weeks before or a couple of months before the Olympic Games and he couldn't go. Uh, between 36 and, uh, 32 and 36, he played wheelchair basketball in, uh, in the second division. And at age 37, he turned his attention exclusively to paratriathlon. And he had some financial support, so he came, he came to us for, for help in terms of uh, physiology and in terms of, in terms of um, training. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the, uh, with the different systems, with the different classes, as I am not, uh, he could use a conventional bike and he could run with the use of uh, specially designed prosthetics. So the follow-up uh, started in January 2011, and it ended in July 2012. That is a 19-month follow-up. And during this period of time, we did uh, six 30-minute uh, swimming tests. Uh, this swim test uh, requires the athlete to swim as far as possible uh, over 30 minutes, maintaining an even pace is possi if possible. And the main outcomes of the test are total distance and swimming velocity. We also did uh, six incremental cycling tests, uh, the same test that I normally use with, uh, with able body athletes, which is a, a test that starts on the load cycle ergometer at 100 watts, and then there are 25 watts increments every three minutes, uh, trying to maintain a constant cadence at 80, 85 RPM. Uh, ooh, the photos. We did four incremental, that's what happens when you finish your presentations in the late, uh, late in the night, the day before the conference. Um, we did four incremental running tests on the treadmill, and I normally start at 10 kilometers an hour, but with him we started at 8.5 kilometers an hour, and we had increments of 1.5 kilometers an hour every four minutes, with one minute break in between uh, stages for uh, blood lactate, and we always used a 1% incline to try to simulate the, uh, the air resistance that you would encounter in an outdoor situation. And we also did uh, seven anthropometric assessments with the main outcomes being body mass and seven, uh, seven skin folds. So in terms of results, um, this is a big table that uh, 
includes all the results, but I, I will summarize it for you. In terms of anthropometry, we used to laugh at him uh, at the end of, uh, of the follow-up, telling him, oh, when you first came to us, you were a fat ass. Because within, within two months, he lost four kilos and he lost about 30% in the sum of seven skin folds. So apparently he was fit enough to play wheelchair basketball, but he was not, uh, or he didn't have the, the physique required for, uh, for triathlon. Uh, in the swim test, his velocity increased by 4.4% uh, in, the, in the first six months, but then it declined back to baseline. But we always had the feeling that he never really managed to master the, the, the performance of the test. He was never able to maintain a constant pace and do the test the, test the way this test uh, should be done. Uh, on the bike, we saw that his absolute and relative cycling maximal aerobic power increased progressively throughout the follow-up uh, period uh, by 22% in absolute power. And because his body mass and his skin falls decreased so much, in relative, in relative values, his maximal aerobic power increased by 33%. Uh, absolute and relative cycling at the uh, individual lactate threshold increased by 40% and 52%. So a very, very big improvement there. And his absolute and relative cycling at the onset of blood lactic accumulation value, which is the intensity corresponding to a blood lactate concentration of four millimoles, which we often use as a, as a reference value to determine the threshold zone between the ILT and, and OBLA increased by 60% and 73%. Uh, running maximal aerobic power improved progressively by about 13%, and running velocity at the ILT and OBLA improved by 39% and 45%. So big, big changes for an athlete that is making a, a, a transfer from a, from a different sport. We were also interested in, uh, in describing the, uh, the training data. So the, what I'm going to show you correspond to uh, 813 training sessions performed over, over uh, 84 weeks. And these sessions included 248 swimming sessions, 229 bike sessions, 216 run sessions, and 120 strength training. On average, he was doing three plus minus one sessions of swimming per week, not very big volumes. He was, he was pretty good at swimming. Uh, and the, the mean uh, over those 84 weeks volume was only eight kilometers per week. Cycling, he was doing usually two or three sessions per week. Quite often we had to stop because he had infections in his, uh, in his leg. So we had to stop, he couldn't put the prosthetics on, and uh, we could only do gym work, etc. So we couldn't do huge volumes with him. So the, the overall uh, cycling volume was about six hours per week, mean value. Of course, there were bigger, uh, bigger weeks in terms of volume. And running, very similar to, um, to cycling in terms of uh, number of sessions, two, two per week. Uh, and that's, again, what happens when you finish your presentation late at night. It's not two kilometers per week. Uh, I have to correct that. Uh, then we had one or two se sessions of strength training per week. And overall, over the 84 weeks, he only had 67 days of, of full rest. 67 days, so that's less than one day per week for the duration of the follow-up. What you see here is the, um, the training periodization in 2012 and 2011. 2011 is the solid line. 2012, you see higher volumes as he was uh, getting adapted to the, to the new sport is the uh, intermittent line, the point line. Basically, the design of the uh, periodized program was similar in both years. As you can see in the sentence at the, at the bottom, training was organized as a traditional periodization macrocycle 
in the first half of, of the season before competition really started. And then we followed that up with, uh, with a block periodization approach for the remainder of the season. But always maintaining flexibility to respond to emerging circumstances. So we, if, if he had a, a problem in his leg, then we would have to change every plan and, and, and adapt to the, uh, to the new situation. So you can see in this graph that uh, those are training loads. Uh, so volumes multiplied by an index of intensity uh, as described by Lucia. So intensity uh, index one, so weighing factor one for uh, zone one of training, uh, weighing factor two for zone two, threshold zone, and weighing factor three for everything that, that was done above the OBLA intensity. You see here the training intensity distributions in 2011 and 2012. Black bars indicate zone one training, that is everything that is below the individual lactate threshold. Uh, the white bars indicate uh, zone two, so everything that was done in between the individual lactate threshold and the OBLA exercise intensity. And the gray area corresponds to everything that was done in zone three, so above um, OBLA intensity. As you can see, there is a huge, huge contribution from what you could consider low to moderate intensity work, both during the first year and the second year. That is the black bars. Most of it is black. And if you uh, analyze the distribution of training intensities per uh, training modality, we find that uh, over the two years, 82% of the swimming was done at intensity one or at training zone one, 14% at training zone two, and 4% at training zone three. The cycling, 91% zone one, 6% zone two, and 3% zone three. And the running, 88%, 8%, and 4%. So it's not really a polarized distribution because there is no bigger emphasis at the very high intensities. It actually uh, decreases. So there is a huge, huge, emph huge emphasis on low to moderate intensity. And then at, as it gets harder and harder, the percentage actually drops. Uh, here you see the competition data over uh, the 19 months. Uh, he did three sprint distance duathlons, including a world championship bronze in 2011 and European Championship gold in 2012, 11 sprint distance triathlons, one Olympic distance triathlon, one half Ironman distance triathlon, and one long distance triathlon. And that was the world championships at home in the Basque Country. In fact, that was not his target. He wanted to qualify for Rio. But when, when uh, world championships, long distance world championships, um, were awarded to uh, Vittoria Gasteis in the Basque Country, he said, well, world championships at home, Rio is very far away, how about if I change my main goal? Why don't I prepare for uh, long distance world championships? Because I don't know if I will ever make it to, to Rio. So we want, the objective for him was to, to be happy, enjoy what he was doing, and we said, if that's what you prefer to do, let's go for it, let's focus on our long distance uh, world championships. And well, he, he won. His time was, this is a four kilometer swim, 120 kilometer bike and 30 kilometer run. He won the, the race in eight hours, 14 minutes and 47 seconds. That's about the same time as a, as a winning Ironman time. Uh, the swim was one hour 15. The bike was three hours 50 and, and the run was uh, three hours and one minute. So basically he beat the, uh, the silver medalist by almost uh, half an hour. So the conclusions before I leave you with a, with a little video that I would like you to see. Physical and physiological evolution over 19 months indicate that these athletes' initial fitness and training levels following a talent transfer initiative were suboptimal for triathlon. So you can be very good in a non-weight-bearing sport like uh, wheelchair basketball, but uh, if you are chubby like he was, 
It won't do it for triathlon. Improvements were achieved through consistent training. So there was a lot of consistency. Even when he had infections in his leg, he continued doing gym work or whatever he could do. Uh, with a strong focus on intensities below the ILT. He needed to work on his aerobic base. Training volumes in each discipline were lower than previously reported for the elite level uh, able-bodied Olympic distance triathletes. We saw Sergio's presentation yesterday with 30 to 35 hours per week. He was nowhere near uh, those volumes. He had to work, of course. He's a translation, uh, his job is, um, he, he dubs cartoons to Basque language. You know, so um, have you seen Sin-chan, that Japanese cartoon of a really bad kid that is really mean to his mother and all that? He's, he's Sin-chan in Basque. That's, that's what he does for a living. And the data reported here could be used as a reference by other elite level para triathletes, particularly those included in the PT4 sport class. If you are interested in all the details of this study, it was published uh, this year in the International Journal of Sports Physiology and Performance. You can find the, oops, you can find the reference here. And if you can't find it, just email me and I will, uh, I will, send, you the, uh, I will send you the PDF. And let's see if this works today. He speaks Basque, but it's uh, subtitled to English. S and I think uh, the translators are going to translate the subtitles to French, just in case. Nire izena Mikel Garmendia da. Auto, bueno, moto istripu batean anka ezkerreko ankar dia galdu nuen. Geroztik argi izan nuen e, kirola izango zala niretzat, ba nire zintasun fisikoa ba gainditzeko e, aukeratu nahi nuen bidea, ezta? Bueno, nire lehenengo kontaktua e, kirol egokituan, kirol egokituan eskia izan zen. Karrasika mendian ni bakarrik eskiatzen ari nitzela eta bueno, jende guztiak behidatzen da bueno, mitzat izan zen da gero no, izugarrizkoa. Eh? Gero hasi nitzan lagun baten medio Iban Perez ho hasi nitzen gurpildu nolkian e, Saskibaloia jukatzea. O sea, Saskibaloia zilarro da zen, ezta. E, salto bera bera nasi nitzan, hor e, taldea guk e, sortu genduen, salto enpresaren e, laguntzaz, bost urte jada eman ditut e, e, saskibaloi taldean, eta bueno, e, beti izan dut egi esan e, buruan e, triatloia egitea. Zen itxikita joten nitzen aitakin, ba, donostiako triatloia ikustea, ezta? Eta beti bai eta eta bio, bueno, ba, miresten genituen e, trial, triat, triatloilariak, ezta? Ze, Eta guretzatzean superheroiak bezala, ez? Olako iru, iru disziplinatan horrela hain sufrimendu puntu hori, ez dakit, ba, ba, jasatea edo, ba, ez dakit, guretzatzean hoitzugarria, ez? Guatzen naiz aitari esan diola, joa, ikusiko zu, ja behin istripo izan dakuan, da, bueno, izan da gero eta esan nion, ikusiko zu nola nik egun batian, jo, kasu entzotz, nik triatloi bat egingo da, eta hanka batekin. Eta, bueno, or, ola erdi txantxetan eta ba, aita, bueno, erdi parre ez da, esan zuen, baina oseme nola ingo zu triatloia enkabatekin eta, eta, bueno, ola siginean, ez da? Ni enatorre ez, ez, ez bizikleta mundutik, ez, ez igeri mundutik eta ez korreka mundutik ez. Ni hasi nitzanean, hori oso gorra izan zen, zen ni, e, bueno, nire min fizikoen aparte, zaurien aparte, en, en, euska, en euskan erreferentziarik. Eta orduan, bai euskal herri maian eta, bueno, estatu maian, e, etxe goen inor, ni, ni bezala, hanka faltaduna, bat triatloia egiten zuenik. 
Tardo ni eres a todo ellos o gorra y sanzán se cae ni que ne quien nun dignora jun ta se a te jo jo ta se seis pilura vegir a tu está ne quien se corri se cose protesi ver nuen ne quien bicicleta ni vil se cose in ver nuen ta y es ane así era batía nasco costa un seiten se triatlo triatlo ya veres oso quiero el gorra da esfuerzo andicua eta eta nos que acaba falta valde más ahí suba algún areta que llego está Nickel came to us uh, about a year ago because he wanted to start uh, his triathlete career. His initial level was not uh, very good. He came here with, uh, with uh, some overweight considering that he wanted to do elite triathlon. So we've worked with him in the same way that we would have worked with, uh, with an athlete that doesn't have any disability. So we have been testing him over the uh, over the past few months and uh, training him over the past few months. And in the last couple of days, we have done uh, some laboratory testing, including uh, anthropometry, uh, running tr running test in, on the treadmill. And today we have just done a, a bicycle test, a progressive test to exhaustion to determine peak, uh, aerobic power and his uh, lactic threshold and, um, and power at four millimole blood lactate concentration. As soon as you start working with this type of, uh, of Paralympic athlete, you forget about the, uh, the limitation they might have and you start thinking about the abilities that they have. You forget the disability and focus on the ability. And that has been our philosophy with Mikel as well. He has obviously uh, some um, prosthetics to run, uh, prosthetics to walk on the street, prosthetics to cycle on the bike, but uh, from our point of view, both as physiologists and as coaches, we consider him an, a, an athlete who wants to come to the, uh, to the elite level in the world stage. Kirola izan da niretzat, bueno, ba, oza, ez dakit, e, nola baita esateko, ba, salbatu nahi buena, ez da. Eta, bueno, tamale zaita junitzit zaigun, eta, eta, ba, Estu, 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 ni que guinda co, ni que guinda co hay cusi es. Mañana, bueno, supongo que ustedes verán que está aquí. Goitico está aquí te, bueno, ya la bala que la ni lo estuvo gula está. Verá que la un sentido va a ahorrar a jarra y secota, bueno, y dar orilla más de ni que está. Le tengo al día está aquí te, el satriato iba a buscar tu nube ni a neta. Hola, el muga más rasear que tú no venían. Esta te salta, tres ton postas, postas una está. Esta que están ni de esta torre y están tan va para arriba. Free to move, ¿está te está? Has que sentirte, o has que está te. Thank you. I don't know if... Uh, I want to say thank you for the effort and the studies and the nice video. But um, in the, I think uh, in the performance point of view, um, when, you, when you talk about uh, elite level uh, and the long distance event, uh, everybody needs to realize we are really far from what is the para triathlon uh, right now, this year and last year. And we have um, some people um, around me uh, working for para triathlete uh, elite. We are talking about sprint distance events like uh, non-drafting events, uh, less than one hour. Um, the, the common sense is to realize the people in this category 
um, of the same uh, average rate like uh, under 23 national uh, or international uh, level athletes. So uh, this is uh, what, so do you realize this uh, study or this case is uh, not really uh, uh, what we can see in Rio next year for para -triathlon? Well, it's true that the, uh, first of all, the classes have changed a lot. Uh, a lot of the guys that, that were competing against him uh, stopped triathlon because they could see that with the new class system they could not compete anymore. Uh, so what I consider is that, well, this is the first report on physiological potential, as far as I know, of, uh, of uh, an amputee, a uh, below-the-knee amputee tri paratriathlete. So uh, I don't think uh, these are the reference values for a sprint distance triathlete, but I think at least it's something, it's, it's, it's a starting point uh, in terms of training volumes, in, in terms of, uh, of power outputs. In that table, you would have the power outputs that he was able to, bu uh, to push on the bike uh, in absolute values, in relative values, at the individual lactic threshold, at the uh, OBLA exercise intensity, same thing in running. So I don't think this is what you have to aim for, for someone who is doing uh, sprint distance para triathlon, but I think it's at least some information that might have some value as a reference point uh, for future researchers and coaches and, and athletes who are working with, uh, with those athletes. I don't know if I answered your question. Um, I think your, your study is perfect. You just, just please uh, do the same uh, in the future with uh, some athletes racing the, even the long distance, but in the elite para triathlon, you need to focus yeah. on the the distance uh, for Rio Paralympics, mm. it's a one hour uh, race. So please do the same with uh, an, uh, an elite athlete racing the world championship, but uh, the real one. I will if I get a chance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.